Mark chapter 16. We're going to begin with verse 1. The setting is the resurrection. And uh, we're going to look at restoration through meekness. Restoration through meekness. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, notice it doesn't say Mary the mother of Jesus. That's a good message there for the Catholics. Why does it say Mary the mother of James? Because Jesus doesn't have a mother. The Son of God doesn't have a mother. Amen. He had a mother when he was on the earth, but he's not in that state anymore. Now he's been glorified. Amen. He's risen. The mother of James in Shalom and had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? When they had looked, they saw that the stone was already rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white, long white garment, and they were affrightened. And he saith unto them, Be not affrightened. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, as he had said unto you. Mark chapter 16, verse 7 says, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. Specifically, tell Peter. The one that denied him. Of course, they all denied him. But Peter was the one that said, though all forsake you, I won't. His guilt was greater than all of theirs. All the others didn't speak up and say, I'm not going to deny you. They were all sifted. They all ran that night. But Peter was the one that spoke up and said, Though they all forsake you, I won't. you got to understand, Peter was living under tremendous, tremendous guilt. He didn't just, he didn't just deny a man. He denied the Son of God. The Son of God. His Creator. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the guilt? Can you imagine? And I believe that Peter, once he denied the Lord, there's a place where he begins to deny that he denied the Lord. And I believe there's a lot of folks in this place today 
but not willing to admit what they've done. And this is people that after they've been born again, people that have been saved. But somewhere along the way, they got away from the Lord. And they've denied it. They've been in denial. It's so painful. Can you imagine the pain? Denying or putting just putting one thing in place of him. Putting something in, in the place of him. How could you ever put something in the place of Jesus? He said, you've left your first love. That you hear preachers quote that you've lost your first love, but that's not what the scripture says. You left your first love. He's no longer first place anymore. Peter, he's not first place in your life anymore. Peter said to the other disciples, he says, I'm going fishing. I don't, you know, it, it's, to me, it's like, just thinking from a human mindset, it was just all a, a bad dream. It wasn't, it, I mean, they just, because you got to understand, folks, even after Jesus turned or uh, multiplied the fish and the loaves. The Bible says they hardened their hearts, and they considered not the miracle. Jesus said, "You're not fo- you didn't follow me because of the miracle." See, I used to think that they followed Jesus just for the miracles, but they didn't even follow him for the miracles. They were following him because they ate the bread and they were filled. You gotta understand. When you get hungry, you remember where you got your meal. And there's people today that will bite the hand that feeds them. But they harden their hearts. That's what Jesus meant when he said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Hypocrisy. That's exactly what the Pharisees did. That's who they were. And he said, don't be like the Pharisees. And so Peter now is in this state of denial. Remember, when Jesus looked upon him that night, he went out and wept bitterly. But he was never converted. He was never converted at that point because the scripture says they acted as though Jesus was not even real you understand folks there was a period of time where the disciples as for this Jesus we know not what has come become of him can you imagine just three years of their life Walking with Jesus, and now it's like it never happened. You know why they went into that place? I'll tell you why. It was painful. You got to understand, it was painful. They loved Jesus, they were hurting. And I'll tell you, nothing opens a door more more quicker to unbelief and doubt than hurt, pain. Just the pain of, can you imagine the depths of the guilt and the pain? that These disciples were like, just, we want to forget it. We just want to forget this even happened. It What a nightmare. 
And it wasn't the days that they walked with Jesus that was the nightmare. It was what followed. It was the arrest. It was the crucifixion. It was all of that. That's what became a nightmare. And they just were going fishing. And just get a little bit of rest from all this. I don't know what they were thinking. What their thoughts were while they were out there on that boat. What their conversation was. Jesus is there on the shore. and Have you caught anything, little boys? No. I haven't caught anything. Because that's probably something that is said, you know. I know that's something I would say. If I saw some guys out fishing, I'd ask them, did you catch anything? Jesus asked them, they caught anything. And he said, cast the net on the right side and you'll find. John, immediately. Where in the world did I hear that before? Can you imagine the shock John begins to put it together. The message, the voice. <laughs> could you, could you see it? Could you see it? Oh, hallelujah! Can you see how that the word and the voice and how it all came together, and just Peter. It's him. <laughs> He's alive. <laughs> Hallelujah. Peter didn't recognize his voice. Peter didn't, didn't even remember that he had said to them way back there, three years prior, cast the net on the right side. It was Peter's boat. But Peter was hurting badly. Much more badly than John. See, what you may not understand is that pain, hurt, unbelief, doubt, it calluses the heart. And Peter was much more calloused, much more hardened than John. Even though John was hardened to some degree. And... Uh, But Peter, remember John outran Peter uh, to the sepulcher, to the tomb. And uh, But Peter swam, jumped in the water, pulling, they're pulling the nets of fish. They're just, but Peter went out ahead of him and he started swimming. Now, you got to understand. Peter does not feel condemned. Even if he did sense any condemnation, it wasn't from Jesus. He's swimming to the very one he denied. He's making his way as fast as he can to the one that he denied. Why? Because he's my only hope. If he doesn't forgive me, I'm in trouble. I like that about Peter. Peter's the one that was sinking and was not too proud to cry out for help. There are people today that are sinking. They're sinking and they're drowning and they're too proud to say help. I've got a friend right now. I says, if you was falling off a cliff and I put, I, I, I'm going to put my hand out to try to help you. If you reject my hand, you'd be pretty stupid. I said, after I helped you back up, after I help you onto the rock and you decide you're going to turn around and jump, that's your business. But I'm going to help you. As long as I can help you, I'm going to help you. I'm going to reach out my hand to help you. And, and Jesus stretched forth his hand immediately and caught Peter.
And after they have had breakfast, Jesus takes Peter aside. And he says privately, Do you love me? And uh, Peter says, Yeah, I love you, Lord. Peter, do you love me? You know, this three times. The third time was agape love, God's love. Something Peter never even knew. He didn't know God's love. And Peter gave the right answer, I believe. He said, Only you know, Lord. That's a great place for every one of us to start. When you think you know something, you know nothing. And it's like I've heard men of God that have, great men of God, I've heard men of God that have been on the way for years, and they'll, they'll make this statement, just when I think I, I know something, I know nothing. Well, the closer I get to Jesus, the more I realize I know nothing. Because it's not about knowledge. It's about His love that surpasses knowledge. Amen? If you stop at knowledge, knowledge just puffs you up. But you've got to get beyond knowledge. The knowledge brings you to Him. The knowledge, amen? Knowledge is only the beginning of, of wisdom, the fear of God. That's, that's just the beginning. But moving on to God's love. Do you love me, Peter? And then he asked him the question that probably many ministers don't get. They think he's talking about the fish when he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Now, I believe at that point, Jesus wasn't pointing at the fish. I believe he was, he took his hand and he kind of, not pointed with his finger, but kind of put his hand out and kind of moved it across saying, Peter, do you love me more than these, all the other disciples? Because Peter had said, though they all forsake you, I won't. And so Jesus was challenging Peter. You know, many, many at this point would, con would have condemned him. But Jesus was challenging him with his own words. Peter, do you really love me more than these? Prove it to me. Feed my sheep. Prove it to me, Peter. Amen. And that's what God's saying to every single one of us. Prove to me that you love me. In other words, don't just say it. Do it. Do something. Prove to me that you love me. Amen? And we know Peter went on to prove that, didn't he? He did go on to feed the lambs and the sheep. Mostly the sheep. Folks, think about this, Mark 16, 7. The angel says, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter. He didn't say and Simon. He said Peter. Many times we see in scripture where his name is Simon Peter. Because there's that mixture. But Jesus said, go tell his disciples and Peter. Can you imagine? I just, it floors me. You know, that, 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 that really floors me. That 
he just mentions all the others as disciples, but when he mentions that specific one that he knows is hurting, he knows he's hurting. He knows that he is under all this guilt. Amen. See, when you go into the Marines or any branch of the service, they strip you down first. Look how Jesus strips down Peter. So gentle, so kind. Right? He allowed Peter to do his own thing, and then he says, By the way, specifically tell Peter, I go before him. He's going to see me. Can you imagine? That's like, that's, a, like, that's like Elijah. Running from Jezebel. Hiding out in a cave. And then the Lord takes him out in a chariot. A fire. In a whirlwind. You see folks. God's ways are not our ways. It's the goodness of God that leadeth to repentance. And I'm still talking about restoration through meekness. It's the goodness of God. It's not when a brother has fallen that you treat him negatively. It's the goodness of God that brings restoration. It's the goodness of God that draws, that deals, that works. Amen. And the Lord even told us, He says, you're also going to be cut off, you Gentiles, if you don't continue in my goodness. So if we're going to have the ministry of reconciliation and reconcile, because there's a lot of ministers in this hour that are really hurting. This was part of Peter's conversion. This right here, where the angel said to Mary, and tell Peter specifically. Make sure you go to Peter specifically and tell him that I go before him. I'll see him. And I'll see him. I'll see him in Galilee. That was part of Peter's conversion. That was part of his reconciliation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, this was not a moral sin that Peter had committed. He didn't commit sin as far as a moral sin. Because of his fear, he denied that he even knew the Lord. He was afraid. He was scared. But see, we, we see Peter goes on to be this great apostle where fear doesn't seem to be a factor for him anymore. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's many out there, like Peter, that need to be restored. And I believe once they're restored, fear won't be a factor anymore. Amen. Glory to His name. The ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile, to restore through the spirit of, through the heart, through the spirit of meekness. Jesus said, learn of me, learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. You'll find rest unto your souls. He mentioned meekness. The meek shall inherit the earth. Amen. Look at Moses, the meekest man of all the earth at that point. And he misses out in the promised land because he didn't use wisdom. He wasn't gentle. Many, many times. This is the only time recorded where, where Moses lost it. How many times does it take for us to lose it before we become unprofitable? Now, you look at someone that's in the limelight, like Jim, Jimmy Swaggart or somebody that's in the limelight, 
uh, that's a long ways to fall because that brings tremendous reproach upon the ministry because of the position he held. But he was still reconciled. Never probably have the ministry he had when he first started, but at least he's still been restored to the degree he has. I don't think he's fully been restored, but I think he's still being restored. Amen. Praise his name. Praise the Lord. Now, Jimmy Swagger, that was moral sin. With Peter, this was simply fear. Amen? It's a big difference. There's a big difference. To whom much is given, much is required. With someone like Jimmy Swaggart, much is required. I'm kind of glad that the Lord didn't put me in a position like Jimmy Swaggart because I still had some things I needed to go through. And I'd hate to think that that could have came back and brought reproach upon the gospel. I believe we are in the time of restoration where the scripture says the restoration of all things. Amen. The Lord is restoring all things. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that exciting? This is the time of restoration. He's restoring everything that was lost in the fall. Everything that's willing to be gathered. Everything that's willing is going to be restored. Hallelujah. And this is what he said. He said, in the last day, I will raise it up. Amen. We've all been through our ups and downs. We've all had our problems. We've all had our, you know, we, we've all been through the sifting process. But now is the time when I believe we're going to have our little campfire uh, breakfast private time with Jesus. Hallelujah. Really, folks? I believe that. I believe that Jesus desires a personal relationship with every single one of us. One-on-one. -on -one. Amen? One-on-one. -on -one. To know Him. To really know Him. And know His love. And know His love. And you remember, He... He revealed himself in, in, in being alive to Mary Magdalene first. She was the first one. Not, not the mother. Not Mary the mother. But Mary Magdalene. And th I think this is why. Is because whom is forgiven much loveth much. And that doesn't mean loveth people as much as it means loveth God. In other words... What is it that ties, what is it that binds us to the Lord? What is it that causes us to be fused to the Lord? It's his love, right? And so Mary Magdalene had been forgiven of much, delivered of seven devils. She's the one with the alabaster box, right? She's the one that was washing Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping his feet with the hair of her head. I mean, she was preparing Jesus for his burial. Are you listening? While all the others didn't believe. She was preparing him for his burial. She understood way back there. And I believe what is the key that opens the door to understanding truth is love because it says because they would not receive the love of the truth that he would send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie 
if the Lord has been gracious to you, if the Lord has been good to you, if the Lord has been just so good to you, then you're going to love Him more. To the measure the Lord has been good to you is to the measure you're going to love Him. And it's not that the Lord desires to be better to one than others. It's that there are those that allow the Lord to be good. Allow the Lord's goodness. They allow the love of Christ. I'm going to make a confession right here. I don't know if you've ever done this, but I did it. And that is, I, the Lord came to me one day. I was in prayer. And he started pouring his love, that, that divine love into me. And I just, I couldn't handle it. And I said, Lord, I'm not worthy of that love. I said, please give it to somebody else. That was so foolish of me. That was foolish. Amen. That was foolish. We need His love. We need to accept His love. So this was Peter's restoration. Peter was being restored. No wonder he became a powerhouse for the Lord. Amen? No wonder he became such a giant in God. Because Peter had been given forgiven of much. Obviously, Paul the Apostle must have been forgiven of much because he said, I was the chiefest of sinners. And we see his sacrifice. We see his selflessness. We see the love of Christ through Paul the Apostle. To whom is forgiven much, loveth much. Amen. Praise God. So let me ask you, friend, are you in that place like Peter? Are you still in denial? Are you still denying what you've done? Are you still denying that you... You know, it doesn't have to be much. It does not have to be a great, gross thing. It can be something so simple. And yet, you're... Because you're denying that you did it, you're living in a lie. To that measure, whatever it was. And the Lord's not going to let you get away with it. Every little speck has to come to the light. Amen? Did you know when the, the, the more powerful the computer chips become, the more... They have to have a controlled environment totally, completely clean. I mean, you're talking airtight uh, conditions where they can't even be any dust. You understand? No dust. If they do that for a computer chip, how much more the Lord, what He's doing in our life, not even a speck, not even, a, not even dust, nothing. In Him is no darkness at all. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, we know that Peter wasn't completely perfected. Because when the Lord gave him the vision of the sheet with the unclean animals, he argued with the Lord. But we also see that Peter went on and he grew and he developed. But I don't think there was one person in the scripture that ever came to the measure of the statue of fullness of Christ. Not one person came to perfection. Even Paul said, not as though I had already attained. Amen. If he promised it, he can present 
us faultless before his throne. But it's going to take love of the truth. You got to love the truth. Love the truth. Love the truth. And not with your love. It must be his love. Remember, they would not receive the love of the truth. They would not receive his agape love. They would not receive his divine love. They wouldn't allow their human love to be exchanged for his divine love. And because they wouldn't receive his divine love, it was only his divine love that could love truth. So these people today that are trying to say they love truth with human love, they can't do it. They can't keep his commandments. Can't do it. It takes the love of Christ. Restoration through meekness. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness lest you also be tempted. That's what he said, didn't he? There's humility. Total humility. And when let me just say this as I'm closing. Somebody that has fallen, somebody that has uh, fallen from grace or needs to be restored, they don't need you to be negative. They don't need you to come and point your finger at them. They're already hurting. They're already kicking themselves. They're already crushed. They're already afraid. They need you to come and hand give them your you give them your hand. Help them up. Amen. Help them up. Now you'll find there'll be some that won't allow you to, they won't let you help them. They're not ready yet. You just leave them alone. They're not ready. But thank God for those that are ready. Amen. Thank for, thank God for those like Peter that say, "Lord, help." Immediately, immediately he stretched out his hand. Hallelujah. He was there all the time. All through that time while Peter was going through the, the thoughts that were going through his mind, all of that, the, the, the whole storm, all of it. I'm talking about after he denied the Lord. He was there. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You see, Jesus is in the business. Not of destroying, not tearing down. He's in the business of restoration. That's what regenerate. That's what regeneration is. He's restoring. This is the time of restoration of all things. Everything's being restored. How exciting. Praise the Lord. A new heaven, a new earth. Praise God. 